Hi everyone, welcome to my talk on the security of smartphone unlock pins and the impact of blacklisting. Before we start, I would like to thank my co-authors because this is not just my work, but this is joint work from all five of us. However, I'm going to present it to you, so what am I going to talk about? First of all, I'm going to answer the question why we should study pins at all. We're going to look at what we know about pins, but also, and more importantly, at the things that we don't know. Because based on those open questions, we designed our user study, whose layout I'm going to present to you afterwards. And then I will close my talk, and this is probably not a big surprise, by presenting the results of our study. But let's start with the most basic question first. Why should we study pins? I assume you've all unlocked your phone today, even those of you who just got up. Some of you may have used a pin for that purpose, but many of you probably don't, because nowadays we use biometrics like fingerprint or face ID. So why pins then? Well, because pins coexist with biometrics as can be seen perfectly here on the right. This phone can be unlocked with an iris scan or a pin. More importantly, biometrics never exist solely on a smartphone, but only in combination with a knowledge-based authenticator, like a PIN. On top of that, it is also important to consider the attacker's perspective here, because in certain scenarios, it can make more sense to try to guess the correct PIN rather than bypassing the biometric. Okay, now to which extent are PINs used? In our user study, we had more than 1200 participants. To find out whether pins are used solely or in combination with a biometric, we first asked our participants whether they use biometry. This revealed that two-thirds do use a biometric authenticator. Those who don't were then asked which knowledge-based authenticator they use, which showed that about 50% use a pin. The percentage among the participants who use a pin in combination with a biometric is even greater. About 75% of them use a pin. Now, when we combine those two numbers, we see that two out of three people in our study indeed use a PIN. And this makes PINs the most widely used unlock form. So let's look at what we know and what don't we know about PINs. Well, on the one hand, we know that users choose predictable four-digit PINs, one of the two predominant PIN length. The other are six-digit PINs, but Wang et al. showed that user-chosen six-digit PINs are also predictable. The good news is, from Bono et al. again, we know that blacklisting popular pins can increase the overall security of the distribution. Now, what don't we know yet? First of all, we don't have a direct comparison of four and six digit pins in the smartphone unlock setting. In addition to that, we don't know anything about the actual effects of different blacklists on the security of pins. While Bono et al. proposed a certain blacklist, it was not tested in user study, which leads us to a third question how to balance security and usability when composing a blacklist. Now, with all those questions in mind, we designed the treatments for our user study, and I want to take a closer look at them now. First, to compare four and six digit pins, we had a control treatment for both length. Users which were assigned to this treatment could just create any pin of the assigned length, and there was no blacklist in place. On the other hand, we had our blacklist treatments. To test the general effect of the blacklist warning, we had placebo treatments. Here, we always blocked the first pin and allowed any other pin as long as it differed from the first one. Again, the idea here was to test whether just seeing a blacklist warning already has an impact. On the other hand, our iOS treatments were designed to test the effect of real blacklist, and not just any, but the two blacklists which are actually used by Apple on its devices. 144 and 146 digit pins. Now you may ask, where did we got those blacklists from? Well, we chose a very direct approach. We use this little setup here, consisting of an iPhone, a Raspberry Pi, a camera, and some Lego bricks. The Pi automatically entered all pins, and the camera, shown on the lower right, was used to detect whether the warning message appeared. Testing all 10,000 four digit pins took about nine hours with the setup. All 1 million six digit pins, on the other hand, took almost one month using two setups in parallel. You can find the full details of this process on our website. The link is at the end of the presentation or in our paper. But let's get back to the treatments. In addition to the ones I already presented, we also had two data-driven treatments. Here we used the Amitai dataset, which was analyzed by Bonu et al. to test two additional blacklist sizes. 
a very small one with only 27 pins and a very large one where we blacklisted almost 3000 pins. Okay, so these are the treatments that we tested in our study. Now let's have a closer look at the study itself. At the very beginning, nothing special. Our participants were informed about the study and gave their consent. Afterwards, there was a practice phase so that the participants could become familiar with entering a pin. At this point, there wasn't any blacklist in place yet, so participants could just enter any pin of the length they were assigned to. Followed by that, we highlighted the smartphone unlock setting again because we wanted to make sure that our participants had this scenario in mind when creating a pin. This step was in place in addition to the fact that the study was limited to mobile devices only, so the participants also had the haptic of a mobile device. Afterwards, the actual pin selection took place. Participants selected either a four or six digit pin, depending on the treatment they were assigned to. If they were assigned to a blacklist treatment and entered a blocked pin, they saw the following warning. If you remember it, this may be due to the fact that you just saw it on the photos from the LEGO robot. It matches the warning that is used by Apple on its devices. After entering and confirming a permitted pin, we asked some follow-up questions about the pin selection and the blacklist warning. Followed by this, our participants recalled their PIN and at the very end, we collected the demographics. All right, that's the design of the user study we used to collect our PINs. Now, before we can analyze them, we first need to define the attacker model. What is the attacker capable of? Well, first of all, we consider an untargeted attacker with no information about the victim. So for example, no birth dates or anniversaries are known. This is important as we know from related work and we also saw it in our study that users select their pins based on this information. And this could be used by an attacker to specifically target a certain user. However, we are interested in the security of pins in general and not specific to a certain user. And because of this, we consider an untargeted attacker. What the attacker does in order to improve the success rate is to guess pins based on the likelihood, starting with the most popular ones. When guessing four digit pins, the attacker is informed by the Amitai dataset that was analyzed by Bruno et al. For the six digit pins, we extracted pins from the Rockyu password leak, just as Wang et al did for their analysis. This restriction is necessary because there's simply no actual six digit pin dataset available. Our attacker is also characterized by the fact that the attack is done online, meaning the attacker is restricted by the rate limiting of the attack device, as can be seen here on the right. When guessing incorrect too many times, a certain pause is enforced. This is very important because neither four nor six digit pins would withstand an offline attack due to the highly limited key space. The rate limiting itself depends on the operation system of the device. On iOS, it's very restrictive. Only up to 10 guesses are allowed before the device locks itself. And those 10 guesses already take an attacker more than one and a half hours. On Android, on the other hand, the attacker is not limited to a certain number, the rate limiting only becomes more restrictive. While 10 guesses can be done within 30 seconds, 100 guesses already take more than 10 hours. For this reason, we're considering 100 guesses to be the maximum a reasonably invested attacker would perform. Lastly, we assume that the attacker is aware of any employed blacklist and thus gives choices which are simply not possible. The reason for that is simple. The user saw the warning on the right and was forced to select a different pin. Having in mind that I just explained on the other slide that it was possible for us to extract the iOS blacklist, this is only reasonable. Now, before I'm going to show you the results of the study, let's quickly recap the three research questions. First, we want to compare the security of four and six digit pins in the smartphone unlock setting. So for example, with the rate limiting in place. Second, we want to see to which extent different blacklists increase the security of pins. And at the end, we want to include the user's perspective and see how we can balance both the need for security and usability when composing a blacklist. But first things first, the security of four and six digit pins. On the following slides, I'm going to show you multiple of those plots, which is why I'm going to quickly introduce them. On the x-axis, we have the number of times the attacker guesses, ranging from 1 to 100. Remember, a rate limiting is in place. On the y-axis, we have the success rate of the attacker. Now, ideally, we end up in the lower right. The attacker guesses 100 times with only very few correctly guessed pins. 
On the other hand, we do not want to end up in the upper left, namely an attacker that is very successful with only a few guesses. Now let's look at the actual plots. At a first glance, we see that the security of four and six digit pins is comparable. However, at a certain number of guesses, there are some differences, for example, up to 10 guesses. Here, we see something which might be counterintuitive, namely six digit pins being less secure. The success rate of the attacker is higher as compared to four digit pins. And from 16 guesses onwards, we see the exact opposite. The attacker is more successful in guessing four digit pins. After 100 guesses, 17% of all four digit pins have been guessed, as opposed to only 14% for the six digit ones. Okay, so certain differences, but overall a comparable security in the attacker model we're considering. Now let's look at how different blacklists can increase the security and how close we can come to the lower right. Let's start with the small data driven and the iOS blacklist. Again, we observe an overall comparable security. This time, despite the fact that we're blocking 27 pins in the one case and more than 10 times as many in the other. On top of that, the security of the selected pins is not ideally yet. So let's see if the effect of the very large blacklist is more promising. It is. Blocking nearly 3000 pins indeed increases the security. And even with 100 guesses, the success rate of the attacker is as low as 1%. Unfortunately, this comes at the cost of low usability. For example, the blacklist hit rate is as high as 70%. This means way more users have to rethink their pin choice than it is the case for the smaller blacklists. But due to the high number of blacklisted pins, users may also need to come with multiple pins. And one of our participants even wrote us an email telling us that the study is broken because regardless of which pin was entered, there was always a warning message popping up. We double checked it, our study was not broken, the participants simply kept entering blacklisted pins before giving up after a total of 8 tries. And this brings me to the final question. How to balance security and usability. For this analysis, we will keep it simple and only look at the success rate of an attacker after 100 guesses. This also allows us to change the x-axis so that we instead look at different blacklist sizes here. The y-axis still represents the success rate of the attacker. Now, we already saw that the less pins we blacklist, the more usable our blacklist becomes. On the other hand, the more pins we blacklist, the more secure our final distribution is. So, Let's look at the actual success rate of the attacker, depending on the blacklist size. First of all, we do not end up with a straight line, but there are different extrema throughout the curve. The maxima, for example, this one shown in red, depict the point where users choose pins which are likely given the attacker's knowledge. Again, keep in mind that the attacker skips blacklisted pins. Minima, on the other hand, like the area shown in green, are regions where users choose pins which are unlikely given the attacker's knowledge. So even given a blacklist, the attacker will not guess many of them correctly within 100 tries. Now, having the user's perspective in mind, we want to blacklist as less pins as possible. Hence, this first minimum depicts the desired trade-off. We blacklist about 1000 pins, so 10% of the overall key space. All right, what did we talk about today? First of all, Pins are still widely used authenticator, although we have biometrics. Afterwards, I explained the design of the user study we conducted in order to learn more about pins. And at the very end, we looked at the results. First of all, the security of four and six digit pins is comparable, giving a limited number of guesses, as it is the case in a smartphone unlock setting. Second of all, a blacklist needs to have a certain size in order to have an effect. This is, for example, due to the fact that we need to assume that the attacker is aware of the blacklist. And last but not least, we need to consider the user's perspective. And then blacklisting about 10% of the key space can strike the balance between usability and security. And this brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them now or also later. So feel free to contact me at any time.